Okay, well, thank you for joining us again. Um, yeah, I was hoping to have a, you know, a good start to my presidency in terms of last night's result. You know, being claimed only the second <laughs> Rotary president to have an international football uh, victory under their belt, but uh, for England, well, obviously not to be. So I'm not sure whether that is, I take blame for that or not. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't work out ideally, did it? Um, yeah, playing, playing defensively and trying to win on penalties, probably not the best strategy. Um, okay, do we have any, any guests joining us today? Roger, uh, can I bring greetings from President Carter and the members of the Rotary Club of Leicester Novus? Thank you very much, Pam. Excellent. Uh, oh, I think that's it. Have we got any other guests? Uh, it's greetings from any other clubs. Um, just a council meeting, so a couple of projects that we're looking at um, taking forward. Uh, we're looking at the um, well, shelter bags for the homeless or, or rotary bags for the homeless. So I think we'll rebrand it just for the rotary title on it. Uh, is one thing we're looking at getting involved in. Uh, another project we're looking at getting involved in is the um, rotary for books. So if anyone has uh, the most recent rotary magazine, um, which is quite good, um, there's a whole oh, uh, numerous articles, four or five on. Rotarians being involved in providing books for school children. Um, if you read the articles, it's quite shocking the number of children that don't actually have books at home. Now, it sounds, you know, I, we always have books at home. You know, my kids did, and, it, and when I was a kid, we always had books at home. But I know my sister is a teacher, and they will do like home visits, and literally, you know, not, not even a magazine. Um, so I think the idea is for us to be involved by donating books and or money to buy books and possibly for Rotarians to volunteer to go into to schools um, to listen to children read. So we'll provide more details in due course, but if anyone's interested in um, volunteering, uh, so it's donating things and supporting that project, obviously if you can let me know, or uh, either directly or via Barry, that would be great. Um, yeah, uh, Barry, any secretary's notices? No. Fine. Any committee chairman reports? Any comments? No. Uh, well, I'll introduce you to Joanna Boers from 2020, who I understand doesn't have a PowerPoint presentation. It's just going to talk to us uh, freehand, as it were. Um, if you could unmute yourself, if you could mute yourself, and hopefully we'll hear what Joanna's got to say. Thank you much, Joanna. Thanks very much. Um, lovely to see everyone. Lovely to see some familiar faces. Um, we've all been through a lot since we last met, um, but 2020 has been through a huge journey. Um, and I'm just going to try and recap a um, little bit of the history of what happened to us last year and then tell you a bit about um, what we're doing at the moment and um, what, where we hope to be going with the uh, charity. So Quite a few of you knew us when we were um, an education and employment charity for disadvantaged young people. Um, unfortunately, at the end of 2019, that whole work became unviable. Um, it was a, a couple of reasons. Um, one was the lack of available funding for that type of work. Um, because our work was so in-depth and specialist, it was um, turned out to be quite expensive per young person, and we, we just couldn't find the number of funders we needed to, to keep the project going. But also we were um, actually lacking in, in young people coming forward. Um, there was a lot of com competition. There were providers who were giving kids a hundred pounds, private providers giving kids a hundred pounds to come through the door um, to get this kind of support that they thought that, that they could get to get them into work. Um, and they were taking a lot of our young people away, uh, but unfortunately not really doing the kind of in-depth work that we were doing. Anyway, it was, the decision was made um, in January that we could no longer continue to operate. We, we didn't have the finances. Um, so in February, a meeting was called and all the staff were made redundant, including myself. Um, but then we took a step back and looked at, we had a, one project which we looked at in, in more in depth, which was our work with um, disadvantaged teenage girls. It's a project we've been running since the beginning of the charity. It's been a bit of a sideline project. Um, and it's really about empowering girls to have be more ambitious, more confident, and to help them deal with a lot of the pressures that we know um, these girls have. I think there's been a lot in the media with the Ofsted report about um, things going on in school, um, in massive impacts of social media um, on these girls. So 
that project had been sort of tootling along side, alongside the main core of our work uh, since we were set up in 2007. Um, the beauty of that project is it's the cost per young person is much less. It's a much more fundable program. It's a program I've managed to fund effectively for. Um, so the decision was made to salvage that one project. Um, and one of the, the fundraising manager was brought back as a CEO and I was rehired uh, on a part <laughs> to do the fundraising. Um, and we were just relaunching the charity on the 15th of March, um, 2020. Hello everyone. Uh, so that's a date I think um, it will resonate in terms of not being the best time to be relaunching um, a charity and, and um, just resetting our, our, our direction. Anyway, we had a small team, um, uh, but we were very enthusiastic and very engaged and, and knew what we were doing. So we were able to very quickly, and I think we really, and this has been acknowledged um, nationally, um, we were very agile at being a small charity and being able to turn our, um, our services into online, to adapt quickly, to not let down the um, three or 400 girls that we were supporting at the time. Um, so we quickly but um, packages of online support and um, using our skills in um, cognitive behavioral therapy to help girls deal with the um, effects of the pandemic. Um, we sent those to schools. They were um, greatly appreciated and uh, over 30 schools across the county um, and city adopted those care packages which were then used online or sent out to individual girls in the community. Um, we also um, started doing our one-to-ones virtually because um, we do see a lot of girls individually um, and we got managed to get all that um, up and running. Unfortunately, some of the more vulnerable girls were in homes where it wasn't suitable because they didn't have a private space and we couldn't get permission. So, there was some attrition along the way, but um, I think we, as I say, we really demonstrated the power of being small and agile. Um, in terms of, of funding, um, we started last year with a deficit, um, quite large deficit. Um, you can see on our accounts, it was about 75,000 um, pounds. So we were in a very precarious position, um, but we, also were very good at um, accessing a lot of emergency funds, a lot of support. And I think because we demonstrated very quickly that we could be effective, we were able to turn our financial position around. Um, and by the end of the year, we had um, six months of um, running reserves. We are now a much smaller charity. Um, we have an annual budget of about 250,000, which, which is down from 1.4 million. Um, we now have recruited a young new staff team. Um, we've lost through the whole process. We've lost all the original staff, but we now have a team um, of eight brand new staff who are all, well, I say brand new, they brand new since we relaunched re the charity. Um, and we operate in Derby, Leicester City, and in Charnwood, essentially. And the staff team is now um, comprised of a, of a coordinator supported by a youth worker in each of those areas. Um, so that's, that's our very effective model. So the work that we do now, um, we work with schools, which we've always done. Um, we go into schools, we provide workshops um, around mental health, emotional well-being, also and this is also on the agenda now, relationship and sex education. Um, the schools now have had an increased um, focus on um, the statutory obligation to provide more of that, and a lot of them are not really prepared. So we work with schools, train the teachers, and delivering sessions on the relationship and sex education. We also work in the community. We have um, community groups which meet after school um, in community venues. And we focus those on areas of deprivation, such as new parks um, and areas of deprivation in, in Loughborough. Um, those groups um, 
we managed to keep them going throughout lockdown in some sort of form. Um, they were meeting virtually um, and also through sort of things like Facebook chat groups and WhatsApp chat groups. So we managed to support those girls as well throughout lockdown. Then a big part of our work, which has become even more important now is, as I have mentioned, is our one-to-one -one support. So these are the girls that are really struggling, um, the ones that have, um, were disadvantaged and vulnerable before the pandemic. Um, but I think, again, you've probably read in the press the effects on the mental health of young people, um, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds has been almost a sort of pandemic of its own. Um, so we support um, those girls, mostly in schools, and we seem to be... Oh, are, you, are you back, Joanna? Did, were you having a problem? Yeah, you, you you just froze for a moment after sporting. Um, I've so. got a message. My internet connection is unstable. I've got <laughs> outreach van app. What do they call it? out? What do they call them? Um, you know the the um, internet people are in a van outside. So <laughs> who knows what might happen? <laughs> Those are the people. Um, I can see their van outside. So anything's possible. So I apologise if I tinkering with my line. Um, wave to me if I get stopped again because I have no idea. Um, so I think I was talking. I was talking about the one-to-ones um, that we deliver in schools, and the fact that we're now being asked by schools to have a worker in the school for the day. And at the beginning of the day, they identify girls that specifically um, are struggling and give us a list of those girls um, throughout the day in that school. We also see girls one-to-one -one out in the community. Um, Throughout lockdown, that was quite challenging, particularly in the winter, because there were no cafes. Normally, we'd meet them in cafes or um, other sort of warm venues. So, again, our team was really innovative, and um, we issued all the staff with with two or three hot water bottles, and these would be filled before the one to one, so they could meet girls in parks, and they'd both sit there with a hot water bottle. Or the vulnerable kid girls that were still at school. Um, our staff would meet them at the school gates and just take the time it took to walk them home to talk through um, all the, the problems that they were having. Um, I, I think at this point I'll, I'll just read you a, a case study of a, just to give you a flavour of one of our girls. Um, I think it helps to sort of make it real. Story is always good for that. Um, Tanya was referred to Love for Life as her school were worried that she was quite introverted and shy and did not make friends very easily. As we got to know her and she opened up to us, it became apparent that her issues were actually a lot deeper than this. And it turned out she's been physically abused by her parents at home. They were controlling what, when she ate and she was not allowed to use bathing facilities. She was losing weight because she was of a poor diet. Her dental hygiene was poor and she'd never had a haircut. Emotional abuse that she'd had to endure was extreme. She was told negative things about herself every day to the point that she'd lost all belief in her abilities and lost her sense of identity. She came to us just before lockdown and when lockdown started, we were extremely concerned about her being stuck in that home environment with no checks and no relief. Through our group and our one-to-one -one pastoral support, she started to believe that she deserved better. And she agreed that we could contact social services crisis team while this was in progress, she jumped out of her bedroom window, broke her ankle, trying to escape from home. Unfortunately, the severity of her situation was not picked up by the hospital, as the parents, her parents told the staff she was simply a depressed teenager and that they were getting her support. At our prompting, when social care investigated her home situation, they found the neglect and abuse so extreme that Tanya was placed in emergency foster care immediately. She was able to pack up a few personal belongings and her identity was anonymized as she was driven away to keep her safe. After six weeks, her temporary foster parents decided that they wanted to foster her permanently, at which, time, which at the time was wonderful news as she was somewhere safe and was going to be well looked after. We went with her to have a look around a new school of her choice nearby and she decorated her bedroom, all the while accessing community adult mental health services and social care appointments getting her physical health back on track with the support of her GP. 
In the summer of 2020, when lockdown was eased, Tanya attended a girls' group event with Love for Life. We went to a cafe and we noticed that she had a drastic restyle. Our coordinator said she looked, just looked like an angel. I barely recognised her. She'd had a haircut, she was wearing beautiful clothes, she looked clean, and her whole energy when she attended the session was just indescribable. It was like she was a completely new girl. Um, Tanya's cake demonstrates how important our love for life support can be to both encourage young people to speak out about hidden abuse and for us to be a trusted friend when they have no one else or have been let down or missed by other services. Although Tanya's case is an extreme one, our work focuses on early intervention on empowering vulnerable teenage girls to lead happy and fulfilled lives. So that just, that gives you a flavor of, you know, the importance. So we did find that, um, a lot of the support um, for these young people melted away um, as a lot of the statutory services weren't equipped for keeping in touch and, and seeing these um, supporting the girls remotely. Um, and in many cases, we were the only people that, that battled through and were there every week for the girls and it became extremely um, important to them. So where, where we are now, so that we've um, obviously now back to face-to-face -face, um, services while well, groups are going well. Um, we're looking forward to doing the pilot with some boys work because we've been asked by the schools um, and also by girls themselves who are saying, well, it's great, you know, we, we work with you, we feel better about ourselves, our confidence grows, but we still have to deal with um, boys who need the same sort of support. So we're looking at doing a pilot for that. Um, we were, um, we're operating um, in all three areas at, at over full capacity. Um, one thing that we've found is that um, now the schools know about us um, and have, word is spreading as, as they open up and they're having time to sort of think about all the issues they've got to deal with. We are getting more and more referrals and we are just getting completely overwhelmed. Our staff are exhausted and um, of course we've had issues of staff having to isolate um, our, it's really important to our young people that our services are reliable because they've been let down by so many people and that's been a real challenge with all the staff, small team um, isolating and, and the amount of demand for our services. So we um, have had enough, we've got enough funding now, we're bringing in another um, manager who's going to also deliver. So between our CEO we'll have a um, programmes manager um, who will work to coordinate the work and we're also looking for funding for extra uh, sessional workers to bring in um, to support our full-time workers so they can deliver more and more groups um, and to free up our uh, permanent staff to take on this enormous demand for the one-to-one -one services. Um, I think Probably, I mean, that's quite a lot of information. I think probably I'll pause there just to see if anyone's got any comments or any sort of questions for me. Um, I'm sure there's sort of gaps in what I've said. It is the first time one of these I've done remotely. It's a different experience to, to being there with you all in the McCure. So um, I'd love some comments and um, questions um, if you've got any. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, Diana. That's very good. Um, oh, we've got a question from Diana. If Diana can unmute herself. Oh, hi there. Um, hi, Diana. <laughs> yeah, a few years ago, I came um, to um, Loughborough and yes. um, spoke, spoke to some of your young ladies. Yes. And I, and I wondered um, whether or not that was something that you will still be doing once it's safe if that makes sense for people to come along to do and whether or not there were any fellow Rotarians that would be interested in sharing their stories and almost like um yeah and sharing that 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 life story I guess um with your um, young ladies to help encourage them yes very definitely um it's something we've always encouraged um and it's you know one of the sad things that obviously we haven't been able to do that we'll definitely be looking to do um, going forward. So yeah, I mean, I'd really love to hear from anybody that would like to, to do that. Um, it, it's really so important. It's not just important for the girls to hear the life stories, it's also important for them to know that there are lots of people out there who care about them um, because they're in this, you know, this underclass of, of young people which are um, 
have got a very um, cynical view of the world and, and whether what, what people you know that go around in well, in suits and have proper jobs think of them and they see an enormous um, chasm between their lives and the lives of people who have had um, had good um, jobs and good you know more privileged lives so anything that can help sort of raise their aspirations and the fact they can be anything they want to be um, it's it's really really helpful so thank, thanks Dan and that'd be great yeah yeah, I mean, I'd love to come again and talk. But you're at the top of the list. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm sure, because obviously, if it's to, if it's to girls, we've got some female Rotarians here who would definitely love to share their experiences. Um, yeah. You know how they achieved from where they were and what their aspirations were as young ladies, <laughs> and then, and whether or not they even achieved them, etc. So yeah, I'm sure some of us yeah. would love to do yeah. that. That would be great. You know, stories again, you know, the life stories are just uh, are really, really helpful. So, yeah, very definite yes to that. Thank you for the offer. Thank you, Diana. Oh, Tony, who's got a question? If you could unmute yourself, Tony. Hi, Tony. Joanna, Joanna, you mentioned your funding had been cut from over a million to 250,000. Where, two questions. What, where's your main funding from? And how, how, how was that, how was that cut? negotiated uh, and was it based on the reduction in your numbers because you'd made redundancies um I, I mean obviously you rely on a lot of external fund um you know individual funding but is it mainly from the local authorities so the 1.4 million was a lot of it was specifically for working with um meet young people young people not in education employment and training um which finished at the end of that year or in some cases we were able to carry some of it forward um, so when we stopped that work, we redid our budget and we rebudgeted our next financial year to be nearer to the two hundred and fifty thousand pound mark. Um, currently, we get we don't get any, and we haven't done for a long time any statutory funding of any kind. Um, we do apply for um, small grants from the community side of the local authority. Um, but that's more of a sort of grant process. It's not, uh, not strictly in, in the sense of statutory funding in the, in the true sense of mission services. So um, historically, um, our funding has come probably about 70% from grants and foundations, um, about 15% from community fundraising, which is you know, events and giving talks such as this, from you know, groups such as yourselves and, and everything from supermarkets to um, doing runs and people holding coffee mornings, um, and we have a, we do have a small but very valuable um, list of individual donors who give a, um, a chunk of money to us every year. Um, and then historically, we've had corporate uh, sponsorship. We were lucky to have KPMG on board with us when we were um, the neat charity for the neat young people. But um, we've lost those corporate sponsors because they they were looking for a different. Um, relationship. So we're going to be trying to find some new corporate sponsorships more in line with supporting vulnerable girls. So our budget for this year is more 85% from trusts and foundations. Um, we realise that our events and things aren't going to bring in the income this year that we expect. We're not expecting corporates to be ready um, and to give um, in any, any um, meaningful way um, until we've developed a relationship with them. So it's going to, I think, you know, we did very well last year, but there was a lot of emergency funding around. We had a big chunk from, which was basically government money that came through the lottery. We had a big chunk through um, CAF Bank. Um, we went for every emergency funding thing from the community foundation, from the Gesture County Council, from um, various other, you know, Tesco's, all these people that were doing emergency funding. And we were very successful at that because you know, so it was, we had a very compelling story. Going forward, I think we're going to see that really being much, much harder. So I think we've got, and all charities are saying we've got tough times ahead. So we're bracing ourselves um, and uh, working very hard to develop relationships with new trusts and foundations. We've got a significant lottery bid in at the moment, which we'll find about out about the first week in August. That'll make a big, di big difference whether we get that or not, because I apply for £60,000 a year for four years. So... <laughs> Fingers crossed for us for that one, please. Yeah. So, so, so basically, your, your target is to—it's not a guaranteed funding of two hundred and fifty k. That's, that's no, no, target. that's our budget. 
yeah, yeah. that's our, that's our, our fundraising strategy is, is in place to, to raise. Um, okay, yeah. yeah, thank you for that, thanks. So, so anybody else got any more questions? Michael, I see Michael's hand. <laughs> yeah, I, I was interested in how you liaise with social services and the uh, education uh, department. Uh, so we have, we tend to, I think it's like most of these things, we tend to develop individual relationships with um, particular social workers or particular um, uh, schools, um, we don't have any relationship with the umbrella organizations on the whole. It tends to be much more on the, um, on the uh, cold based workers level where we just um, promote our work um, through, often it's through word of mouth. Um, we've, in Lata, we've got a particularly good relationship with community adult mental health service because there's one person there that found out about us and he's um, kept us very busy by um, promoting us to other people in his team. Uh, he's about to leave, so that probably our <laughs> referrals from the community mental health team will reduce, but at the same time, schools talk to each other, so we're getting more and more schools um, on board. So we've just taken New College and New Parks just coming on board. We've got Lancaster Academy, various other Leicester schools. We've got Reek Valley in the county just making inquiries. Um, so it's there's no sort of formal way of, of it tends to be sort of more um, as I say at the really um, old place type um, of promoting um, word of mouth. Is that, is that is that that's fine? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you, Carla. Uh, I think it's just over a gas part D just to uh, give the voter thanks up on behalf of the club. Yep, thanks, Scott. Uh, Joanna, it was six years ago that I met you for the first time. Yes, I remember it well. <laughs> uh, and you shared your story with us, with us at the Mercure Hotel, and I admit I was shocked and saddened uh, when you told us that there were hundreds of young people in our, in our city suffering from a wide range of serious abuse and other issues. I would suspect that most people at that meeting, like me, had no idea of the scale of these problems. But uh, I felt grateful that 2020 existed and believed in these young people after every other agency, including, the, including their own schools, had, had, had given up on them. I was so impressed by the good work of, of, your, of, charity, of your charity at the time that I, that I visited your premises on Charles Street uh, with some fellow Rotarians. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you very carefully selected youth leaders who had successfully overcome their own issues. And, and therefore understood exactly where the youngsters were coming from. And so, yeah, that, I, I thought that was very keen. You did a very good job at that. Um, I thought the entire team did a great job of listening and respecting every individual rather than preaching or telling them off. And it was obvious to me that this wasn't just a day job for you and your team because you all genuinely cared about young, vulnerable people in your care uh, and wanted them to succeed in their, in their own way. I'm very excited by the new direction that you have taken this year, and I hope you continue the great work that you have been doing in our community. I now ask my fellow Rotarians to show their appreciation in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very touched by your words. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Joanna. Thanks, Pondu, for a great photo. Thanks. Um, notice we've got a couple of guests. Uh, we've got Muriel, I think, has been with us before. Hi, hey, Muriel. I don't think she could make it today because she ah. said it was going to be about eight o'clock in America, but she, hopefully she'll make it next time. Okay. All right. Uh, and then, um, is it Abby, Abby, June? Do you want to unmute yourself and just tell us? Tell me how I mispronounce your name will be a good start. Yeah, um, Abiodun. Okay. Hi, Abi, Abiodun. Yeah. Fine, fine. Welcome to join. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, well, right. uh, bear with one second. Right. Uh, right. There's no, uh, there's, um, there's no meetings after lunch today. Um, next week's meeting, uh, which I'm really on to, we have one second. It is Oliver Cufflin, who I believe is Ed Cufflin's brother, uh, and retiring, who's chairman of Leicestershire and Rutland Blood, Bike, Blood Bikes, 
talk. Uh, blood bikes, not your normal bunch of bikers. So I hope that'll be mm -hmm. exciting. Um, we were trying that as, a, as another test meeting. So myself uh, and a couple of other Rotarians will be at the Grand. I think Ed's brother will be at the Grand as well. Um, the rest members will join by Zoom as normal. And that will be um, a trial or precursor to hopefully returning to normal meetings at the beginning of August. So that gives us a week or so, does it, a couple of weeks. Uh, obviously, depending what, I think, uh, the Prime Minister's announcement later today about rules and regulations, et cetera, regarding COVID and safety. Um, does Richard have any update to give us in respect to Leicestershire hospitals? No, no update, that's fine. Um, if there's nothing else, I think it's just left for me to call this meeting adjourned and I'll see you all next week. Thank you very much.